Disintegration and Pain Michaela stayed awake many nights when she was in pain. When her grandfather came to visit, he gave her a few of his Tylenol 3S, which contained codeine. Then she could sleep, but not for long. Our rheumatologist, instrumental in producing Michaela's remission, hit the limit of her courage when dealing with our child's pain. She had once prescribed opiates to a young girl who became addicted. She swore never to do it again. She said, Have you tried ibuprofen? Michaela learned that doctors don't know everything. Ibuprofen for her was a crumb of bread for a starving man. We talked to a new doctor. He listened carefully. Then he helped Michaela. First, he prescribed T3s, the same medication her grandfather had briefly shared. This was brave. Physicians face a lot of pressure to avoid the prescription of opiates, not least to children. But opiates work. Soon, however, the Tylenol was insufficient. She started taking Oxycontin, an opioid known pejoratively as hillbilly heroin. This controlled her pain but produced other problems. Tammy took Michaela out for lunch a week after the prescription started. She could have been drunk. Her speech was slurred. Her head nodded. This was not good. My sister-in-law is a palliative care nurse. She thought we could add Ritalin, an amphetamine often used for hyperactive kids, to the Oxycontin. The Ritalin restored Michaela's alertness and had some pain-suppressing qualities of its own. This is a very good thing to know if you're ever faced with someone's intractable suffering. But her pain became increasingly excruciating. She started to fall. Then her hip seized up on her again, this time in the subway on a day when the escalator was not working. Her boyfriend carried her up the stairs. She took a cab home. The subway was no longer a reliable form of transportation. That March, we bought Michaela a 50cc motor scooter. It was dangerous to let her ride it. It was also dangerous for her to lack all freedom. We chose the former danger. She passed her learner's exam, which allowed her to pilot the vehicle during the day. She was given a few months to progress towards her permanent license. In May, her hip was replaced. The surgeon was even able to adjust for a pre-existent half-centimeter difference in leg length. The bone hadn't died either. That was only a shadow on the x-ray. Her aunt and her grandparents came to see her. We had some better days. Immediately after the surgery, however, Michaela was placed in an adult rehabilitation center. She was the youngest person in the place by about 60 years. Her aged roommate, very neurotic, wouldn't allow the lights to be off even at night. The old woman couldn't make it to the toilet and had to use a bedpan. She couldn't stand to have the door to her room closed. But it was right beside the nurse's station, with its continual alarm bells and loud conversations. There was no sleeping there where sleeping was required. No visitors were allowed after 7 p.m. The physio, the very reason for her placement, was on vacation. The only person who helped her was the janitor who volunteered to move her to a multi-bed ward when she told the on-duty nurse that she couldn't sleep. This was the same nurse who had laughed when she'd found out which room Michaela had been assigned to. She was supposed to be there for six weeks. She was there three days. When the vacationing physio returned, Michaela climbed the rehab center stairs and immediately mastered her additional required exercises. While she was doing that, we outfitted our home with the necessary handrails. Then we took her home. All that pain and surgery, she handled that fine. The appalling rehab center? That produced post-traumatic stress symptoms. Michaela enrolled in a full-fledged motorcycle course in June so she could continue legally using her scooter. We were all terrified by this necessity. What if she fell? What if she had an accident? On the first day, Michaela trained on a real motorcycle. It was heavy. She dropped it several times. She saw another beginning rider tumble and roll across the parking lot where the course was held. On the morning of the second day of the course, she was afraid to return. She didn't want to leave her bed. We talked for a good while and jointly decided that she should at least drive back with Tammy to see the site where the training took place. If she couldn't manage it, she could stay in the car until the course finished. En route, her courage returned. When she received her certificate, everyone else enrolled stood and applauded. Then her right ankle disintegrated. Her doctors wanted to fuse the large affected bones into one piece, but that would have caused the other, smaller bones in her foot, now facing additional pressure, to deteriorate. That's not so intolerable, perhaps, when you're 80, although it's no picnic then either, but it's no solution when you're in your teens. We insisted upon an artificial replacement, although the technology was new. There was a three-year waiting list. 
This was simply not manageable. The damaged ankle produced much more pain than her previously failing hip. One bad night, she became erratic and illogical. I couldn't calm her down. I knew she was at her breaking point. To call that stressful is to say almost nothing. We spent weeks and then months desperately investigating all sorts of replacement devices, trying to assess their suitability. We looked everywhere for quicker surgery. India, China, Spain, the UK, Costa Rica, Florida. We contacted the Ontario Provincial Ministry of Health. They were very helpful. They located a specialist across the country, in Vancouver. Michaela's ankle was replaced in November. Post-surgery, she was in absolute agony. Her foot was mispositioned. The cast was compressing skin against bone. The clinic was unwilling to give her enough oxycotton to control her pain. She had built up a high level of tolerance because of her previous use. When she returned home, in less pain, Michaela started to taper off the opiates. She hated Oxycontin, despite its evident utility. She said it turned her life gray. Perhaps that was a good thing under the circumstances. She stopped using it as soon as possible. She suffered through withdrawal for months, with night sweating and formication, the sensation of ants crawling upside down under her skin, she became unable to experience any pleasure. That was another effect of opiate withdrawal. During much of this period, we were overwhelmed. The demands of everyday life didn't stop just because you have been laid low by a catastrophe. Everything that you always do still has to be done. So how do you manage? Here are some things we learned. Set aside some time to talk and think about the illness or other crisis and how it should be managed every day. Do not talk or think about it otherwise. If you do not limit its effect, you'll become exhausted and everything will spiral into the ground. This is not helpful. Conserve your strength. You're in a war, not a battle, and a war is composed of many battles. You must stay functional through all of them. When worries associated with the crisis arise at other times, remind yourself that you will think them through during the scheduled period. This usually works. The parts of your brain that generate anxiety are more interested in the fact that there is a plan than in the details of the plan. Don't schedule your time to think in the evening or at night. Then you won't be able to sleep. If you can't sleep, then everything will go rapidly downhill. Shift the unit of time that you use to frame your life. When the sun is shining and times are good and the crops are bountiful, you can make your plans for the next month and the next year and the next five years. You can even dream a decade ahead. But you can't do that when your leg is clamped firmly in a crocodile's jaws. Sufficient unto the day are the evils thereof. That is Matthew chapter 6 verse 34. It is often interpreted as live in the present without a care for tomorrow. This is not what it means. That injunction must be interpreted in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, of which it is an integral part. That sermon distills the ten thou shalt nots of the commandment of Moses into a single prescriptive thou shalt. Christ enjoins his followers to place faith in God's heavenly kingdom and the truth. That's a conscious decision to presume the primary goodness of being. That's an act of courage. Aim high like Pinocchio's Geppetto. Wish upon a star and then act properly in accordance with that aim. Once you are aligned with the heavens, you can concentrate on the day. Be careful. Put the things you can control in order. Repair what is in disorder and make what is already good better. It is possible that you can manage if you are careful. People are very tough. People can survive through much pain and loss. But to persevere, they must see the good in being. If they lose that, they are truly lost.